on uh, Friday, August 4th. Uh, we were on a motorcycle ride, and the motorcycle we were on uh, was hit by a car. We were both thrown from the motorcycle. Uh, we landed approximately 20 to 25 feet away. When I came to from the accident, my wife Amy was uh, lying face down on the ground, unconscious. We were taken by paramedics to the hospital, and I said at that point to my husband when we were sitting there um, that, that I really wanted to find out who the woman was that uh, was there with me, and, and I'm emotional, um, that was there with me, and who talked to me and let me know that everything was gonna be okay. And my husband looked at me and he said, what woman? And I said, well, the woman that was there who had talked to me. And he said, Amy, there was no woman there. For as much as Rod would say, Amy, there was no woman there, I would say there was absolutely a woman there. The witness confirmed that there was no woman there. Um, and he said something to the effect about your, your wife having a guardian angel there. Maybe the, the purpose even in, in why this happened at all was just to let us know that there were divine beings in this world um, that are there just helping us out. Um, sometimes we're aware of them and sometimes not. Well, we are excited to begin our new series on stories of the supernatural, and I'm thankful, you know, it's one thing to hear about, you know, 20 foot tall, you know, angels, angels that, you know, do things, but the Bible teaches that, that we have to be careful because many times we're entertaining angels and we're unaware of it, um, that all around us constantly, consistently, there is divine activity that God is providing, that God is employing on our behalf, and I think it's important that we take a little bit of time and look into um, how all of this works. Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, and we're going to look at the life of Jacob, who had several encounters uh, with God, with angels. Again, all month long, we'll be looking at the other side of it, fallen angels or the d devil, demons, We'll be looking at eternity, several things. It's going to be a great month. You're not going to want to miss. Let's look at verse number 12, Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. You doing good? Doing all right? You glad to be here? Wasn't worship powerful, exciting, so good, so incredible? A little bit of talent, a little bit of talent. Verse 12. Then he dreamed, speaking of Jacob, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Let's drop down to verse 16 for time's sake. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put his head on and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means the house of God is the gate of heaven. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. And Jacob made a vow saying this to God. Listen to the vow. If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, make sure that I get back to my father's house. We'll talk about that in a minute. Make sure that I get back there in peace, unharmed. Then... The Lord shall be my God. And oh yeah, by the way, in verse number 22, God, I'll give you a tenth of everything you bless me with. Don't worry, it's not a sermon on tithing. You'll be just fine. <laughs> Genesis chapter 32. A few more verses. 
and I promise we'll talk very quickly. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. I want you to really see this, though, with your own eyes in the Scripture. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Most scholars, matter of fact, I did not run across the scholar that didn't believe that this is speaking of Jacob wrestling with God himself. And now when he saw in verse 25 that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled with him. And God said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. In verse 30, Jacob called the name of this place Penel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And he left this place and he walked with a limp. I want us to look at the life of Jacob, but before we do, I think it's important that you know the ministry of angels is very biblical. This is not far out there. This is not extreme. This is not... Um, like a fringe type Bible discussion. Hebrews 1 and verse 14 says, angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to heirs of salvation. Psalms 91 and 11 says, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Somebody said one time, do I have a guardian angel? And the answer to that is yes, you have as many guardian angels as you need, depending on the situation you're facing. He doesn't just give you a angel. He gives you angels, plural, to keep you in all your ways. How many of you have needed angels, plural, <laughs> to be where you're at today? Angels are mentioned 334 times in the Bible. 21 times in the book of Acts alone in the early church. 74 times in the book of Revelation, which again we know is a prophetic picture. So angels are not going away is what the Bible is telling us. 230 times you see angels carrying out a God-given task, a God-given assignment in a specific person's life. In the Old Testament, three angels brought the promise to Abraham and Sarah. Two angels rescued Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. One angel told Abraham about the sacrifice that would be there in, as the ram in the thicket. An angel spoke to Moses about God, about God's plan, about where God would meet him. And an angel was there to deliver in the, in the delivery and the giving of the law. Angels strengthened Elijah when he, was, when he was depressed and discouraged. Angels are known to be so powerful that one angel alone destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. An angel was there to comfort Daniel in the lion's den. An angel was there with the he three Hebrew men as they walked through the fiery furnace. Another angel is seen after Moses has died, the Bible says that Satan came to steal the bones of Moses. What would the devil want with Moses' bones? But the Bible says God saw it and he dispatched Michael the archangel to go and contend and fight for the bones of Moses. Somebody asked one time, does God really care about the intimate details of my life? I would say God not only cares about the intimate details of your life, but he even cares about the intimate details about who you are after this life. Angels in scripture we see are in the life of Christ. They announced Jesus's birth. They ministered to Jesus after 40 days and 40 nights in the desert after he was tempted by the devil Angels came and ministered to Jesus. And if Jesus needed the ministry of angels, I want you to know you're probably also in need of the same thing. Angels strengthened Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prepared to go to the cross and face the crucifixion for your sin and for mine. 
Angels were there as the stone was rolled away from Jesus' tomb. Two angels stood and guarded the tomb after the resurrection. Two angels spoke to the 500 when Jesus was ascended to the right hand of the Father. Those angels were there to continue to solidify the message that Jesus gave them, those angels were there to say, stick with the plan, stick with the purpose that Jesus has set forth. In the early church, they were there to open prison doors for the apostles. Angels directed Philip to a specific place and to a specific person that needed to be ministered to. Angels told Cornelius to send for the apostle Paul that he needed to meet with him in order for the New Testament church to fully realize its ministry, not just to the Jews and for the sheep of of Israel, but also for the Gentiles and also for those outside of the covenant. An angel killed Herod for his arrogance. An angel stood with Paul and his crew when they were shipwrecked wrecked, 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 and at sea after a day and a night at sea in the middle of a hurricane. Angels are prevalent in the Bible is what I'm hoping that you see. If you don't understand how prevalent angels are. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11 says that there's 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels. To give you an understanding of this, 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands plural. So let's just go with the lowest plural thousand we can find at 2,000. So 10,000 times 10,000 times 2,000 equals 400 trillion angels. <laughs> Hebrews 12, says you and I have an innumerable company of angels. I'm trying to get you to see that there are angels all around working, employed by God for you and for me. You maybe are here and you saying, well, what about the devil? Isn't there fallen angels? Yes, one third of them fell. So what that tells me is whatever attack you're facing, whatever struggle you're up against, whatever the enemy's plans are with you, that you have two angels at a minimum for every single demon that the enemy can launch against your life and your home, which means more are for you than are against you. And so we read the story of Jacob. To give you the background on Jacob, Jacob was a crooked man. He was a deceitful man. His very name means deceiver, surplanter. He was a manipulator. He was a liar. He would step on who he needed to step on. He would do whatever he had to do. He didn't care if he hurt you. He didn't care if he messed your life up. He didn't care if he wrecked you. He was going to get what he wanted out of life no matter what it took. That's Jacob. And Jacob had a brother whose name is Esau. Now Esau was the Spartan of the family. He's the man's man. He's hairy, got the big beard. He's the hunter. He's the man's man. Jacob is like a mama's boy. He stays back home. He, he, he's, he's, and so here you have Esau, who is the firstborn of the two. They're twins. Esau came out first. Esau, again, is the man's man, and he's out hunting, and he gets so hungry after several days that he comes home, and they had been making some soup, and Esau says, I'm hungry, give me some soup, and Jacob says, I'll give you some soup, but I want your birthright. Esau, not thinking in a moment of vulnerability, says, yeah, yeah, whatever, no problem, it's yours. Years later, Isaac, the father, is dying. He cannot see. He's blind. And Jacob goes one step further to putting on animal hair and going to his father's death, deathbed and acting like he's Esau to receive the blessing that only came on the firstborn, which is a significant blessing. You're going to receive the family business, the family inheritance. It's all going to be yours. Whatever the siblings get, you're the one in control of it all. And Jacob went and deceived his own dad out of his brother's birthright. And so Jacob is a deceiver. Jacob is not He's not a good guy. He's messed up. He, he, he's doing whatever he can. He doesn't care who he hurts. And Esau 
isn't the type that's just going to lie down. He's not going to just take it. He's not, he's not going to just sit back and let this happen to him. So he's so upset at his brother's deceitful ways, he sets out to kill his brother. Well, their mom hears about Esau's plan to kill her little baby, the little mama's boy, Jacob, she warns Jacob and she says, you have to run. You have to run for your life. Esau's not playing around. He's gonna kill you. You don't have a chance. And so Jacob is running for his life. Esau is tracking him down, trying to hunt him. Esau's going to kill Jacob. He's gonna deal with him. He's going to get rid of him. After day and night, Jacob running for his very life, he collapses and he passes out And as he's sleeping, he has a dream. And the dream is of a ladder. And on this ladder, he sees angels ascending and descending. As he wakes up from this dream, he says this is such an awesome experience that he's had that he's going to call this Bethel, which means the house of God is the gate of heaven. And this experience is so amazing that it changes Jacob's life. At that moment, Jacob learns he's not alone. It's not that God's putting on a show for Jacob. God's just pulling back the curtain briefly for Jacob to see the activity of God and the divine activity that God provides at all times for all of us that's happening in an unseen arena. Jacob catches a glimpse of this, and he is so amazed by the presence of God's divine assistance in his life He, in that place and in that moment, makes a decision that he is going to serve this God and serve this experience that he's had after being desperate and exhausted running for his life. And so he says some things to God. He says, God, if if you'll keep me from my brother, If you'll make sure that he doesn't kill me and he doesn't give me, I know I've hurt him. I know I've done wrong. I I don't want you to make things right with my brother. Just don't let him find me, hide me from the harm that's out there. If you'll do that and then you'll keep me in all my ways, meaning if you'll bless my dreams, if you'll bless my desires, if you'll bless my plans, And then if you'll give me my material things that I need, all those things, whatever I feel like I need, whatever the stuff that I think that I need, if you'll provide those things for me. And then if eventually you'll let me find my way back to my father's house, the one that he stole, this is the blessing that he stole from his brother. God, if you'll find a way, I know that it probably wasn't the right thing to do, but if you'll just let me go back and have that blessing that I deceived my brother and my father out of too, that would be pretty awesome. And then, oh yeah, by the way, if you'll do all these things for me, I'll let you be my God. And wink, wink, you can have a tenth. Because I know you need my tenth God. And so God and Jacob are having a negotiation. And Jacob has all these preconditions that come with this desire that's in him to serve God. And a lot of us come to God just like Jacob does. We come exhausted. We come downtrodden. I don't know about you, but I didn't come to God when I was blessed and happy and had all the friends that I needed and life was going exactly. That's not when I came to God. If that's how you came to God, good for you. But when I came to God, I was hurting, I was broken, I, I, life was not going the way that I wanted it to go. I kept messing everything up. I knew that if I lived my life the way I was living it in the future, that my future was one of destruction. It was one of probably death. It was one of, of pain and hurt. No question, when I came to God, I was like Jacob. I was exhausted. And when I came to God, I wanted God to help me. I wanted him to give me hope. I wanted him to give me peace. I, I, I wanted certain blessings on my life. And I, I did want God to use me. And I did have a purpose. And I did have a plan. And just like Jacob, many of us come to God in this way. And just like Jacob, we see ourselves in a church, Bethel, the house of God. 
And we experience God in a way just like Jacob did. And we say the same things he did. Man, this is awesome. God loves me. He died, gave his son. He died for me. And this God wants a relationship with me. And this God wants to bless me. And this God wants to help me. And this God wants to give me forgiveness and new beginnings and new starts. And he wants to give me a purpose. And he, he wants to give me a, the blessings of God on my life and the promises of God and, and all the things that we say all the time, the things that we sing. He's a God of miracles and all the things that we see. He's never going to leave me. He's always with me. I'm never alone. Alone. He's never going to forsake me. Oh, man, this place is awesome. And like Jacob, we make some deals with God. God, if, if you'll bless my dreams, if you'll make sure my material stuff is like it needs to be, because in our mind, serving God means that we're moving up. And as God is lifting me, if God's elevating me, if God's blessing my things, my stuff, my plans, even my deception. If he's blessing me, I'll let you be my God. And maybe if you do all these things exactly the way I want them to, and you take me up high enough, I, wink, wink, might give you a tent. So Jacob's view of how God works is a ladder. You know, God does want to bless you. God does want to bless your family, bless your plans, bless your dreams. He does. He, he's a God that cares about all of those things. But we have to be cautious if we think what God's ultimately after is blessing our things. We have to be really, really careful if we think that this is ultimately what God's after. Because God did bless Jacob. God did take care of Jacob. God did provide Jacob a safe place. God did provide Jacob land and flocks and a family and two wives. The first one he wasn't that into. Had cow eyes is what the Bible says. I don't know what that means, but... Is anybody nervous that I'm still up here right now? Yes. You're starting to figure out what the crutch is for, right? Just in case I fall. God did bless Jacob. 20 years goes by, and Jacob is blessed. 20 years, Jacob experiences God like a ladder. 20 years. And all of a sudden, he has another encounter with an angel. And the angel comes to Jacob. He says, Jacob... Esau's found you. He's coming. He's not coming by himself this time. He's got 400 trained hunters with him. For 20 years, he's been stewing. For 20 years, he's been thinking about this revenge, and getting even with you. The pain that he's going to inflict, he's going to get even. And Jacob, he's coming for you. you. Can't hide this time. Can't run this time. You're not getting away this time, Jacob. He's coming for you. And Jacob is led once again to another encounter with God. The second encounter with God is a wrestling match. And Jacob is wrestling with God. And as he's wrestling with God, he says something different the second time that he didn't say the first time. He says, I will not let go until you bless me. Now imagine if you are Jacob and you are imagining you've got children now, you've got wives now, you have responsibilities now, you know Esau, you know the kind of killer he is, you know what kind of what he's capable of. And now he's got 400 men coming for you. Your last days on the earth, your days are numbered. It's, and he's in the presence of God and he's not bringing up the threat. And he's not bringing up the danger. And he's not requesting that God protect him. And he's not bringing up, hey God, will you let me go back and get my father's blessing again? And the one I run, he's not saying any of that stuff. This time he's saying, God, I, 
will not let go of you. He's not saying, I will not let go of the blessing. He's not saying, God, I'll hang on to you. He's saying, yeah, if you'll bless me. He's not saying, will you bless my things, my ways, my possessions. This time he's saying, bless me. Bless me. I need your blessing. And I know your blessing is not found in the things, in just the blessings along the way. I know that your blessing is found in me grabbing a hold of you. And if I have you and I'm not seeing necessarily all those other blessings, I am a blessed man. And God says, okay, I'll bless you. I'll bless you. I'll bless you. And God reaches out and he breaks Jacob's hip. Jacob says, bless me. And God says, okay. (laughs) Could it be that God's way of blessing us is different than the way we think of God's blessing on us? Could it be that we want the blessings, the latter, but what God wants to do is he wants to make sure we're broken. If we're not careful, we'll come into church like Jacob did and we'll be seeking God's hand, not his heart. We'll be seeking the gift, not the giver. The blessing, not the blessor. I know it's not a word, but take it. (laughs) If we're not careful, we'll be coming in wanting to see what only an angel can do instead of realizing that we can grab a hold of the one that created 400 trillion plus angels and what he can do for you. But that comes through brokenness. You see, if you study the pattern of Scripture, it's the same. God blesses you, he breaks you, and he gives you. That's how God works. You cannot fully receive the blessing of God until you're broken. But once you're broken, you learn that it's so, the blessing is so he can give you. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's not a preacher cliche. That is the word of Almighty God. If you want to be more blessed, if you want to worship an angel, if you want to worship what kind of blessing an angel can give you, that's that's one kind of blessing. But an angel ultimately is going to lead you like he did Jacob to a face-to-face encounter with God. And when you have a face-to-face encounter with God, you don't leave there talking about all these things you want him to do for you. You leave there broken. You leave there understanding, God, I thank you that you've blessed me to be a blessing. That what you've given to me, what's happened in my life. The, the scripture where it talks about the woman going to Jesus and, and she took that expensive box of costly oil and spikenard and she worshiped Jesus with it. It wasn't that she brought it to Jesus that was significant. It wasn't what she invested in it that was significant. It was that she was willing to break it and give it that was significant. You see, our problem is we want the blessing, but we don't want the brokenness. We don't want to be broken, but God can't give you until you've been broken. We want God to bless our churches, but God wants a broken church. We want God to bless our families, but can I tell you something, husband? If you're going to be the real husband you need to be, it's not going to be because everything's perfect and just it's going to be when you're broken. That's when... 
Isn't it what Jesus said? This is my body, which is broken for you. It was broken so it could be given. We celebrate the resurrection, but Jesus said, don't you forget I was broken first so I could be given. The Bible says a broken heart he will not despise. Brokenness is what God's looking for. It's what he desires. You know what happens with Jacob? Jacob leaves the face-to-face encounter with God. He goes out to face his brother. 400 men that have been planning, strategizing this moment, this day. Oh, man, revenge is sweet. It's going to happen. Jacob finally is going to get what he deserves. And when Esau sees Jacob, not and his blessings, but when he sees Jacob's brokenness, all that anger, all that resentment, all that bitterness in a moment is broken off of him. And he runs to Jacob, instead of killing him, instead of revenge, they hug. Now watch Jacob. Jacob's not saying, oh, I'm so glad that you let it go. Now, can I go back and enjoy the blessing I stole from you 20 years ago? Are we that good that I can go back? No, Jacob's not asking to go back. As a matter of fact, he's saying, I don't want anything to do with it, it's all yours. I'll go somewhere else. You tell me where to go, I'll go there. Does it really matter? I want want nothing from you. Esau, as a matter of fact, everything you see here, everything I have, it's yours. Notice when God blessed Jacob, he wasn't out trying to get something from Esau this time. He was saying, God, use me to be a blessing even the ones that are out there to do me harm. It's incredible what God can do through somebody that's been broken. We want a ladder. God wants to give us a limp. 